And so all human beings are destined by God, it's ordained this way, to return to the dust from whence you came. And so all human beings are destined to die, and then they are held to face judgment at the end of the age. And so likewise, God sends the Messiah to mediate His activity, to be sacrificed once before executing judgment. So it says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. And so we interpret the Scriptures in a very simple, straightforward, chronological manner in which you have God waiting in mercy in this age before the day of the Lord and the the day of judgment. And we could summarize this approach to the scriptures as cruciform apocalyptic, meaning this age is building in anticipation to a climactic crescendo, an apocalyptic ending. And this age is characterized by the cross. It's shaped like the cross. It's formed like the cross, cruciform. So cruciform apocalyptic, uh, that's it, it, theological geek speak, so don't be intimidated. It's just, it just means preaching the cross in light of the day of the Lord. And that the cross and the day of the Lord are the two essential events that represent not only life as it is and redemptive history, but the nature and character of God, who God is. We ask, what is God like? Who is God? How do we know God? Well, we know God by knowing the cross. And we know God by the day of the Lord, like Acts 17 and Paul in, in, uh, in Athens. And here's a group of people who ha- they have no idea, absolutely complete delusion about reality, how life is on earth. And Paul says, let me explain to you how life is. And he starts in Acts 17 with Genesis, explains they're created by one true God, pushes it through that God has allowed them in their idolatry. He's been merciful, but he set a day when he will judge all of humanity by the one that he's appointed. And so you have a, this is, let let me explain to you how to know the unknown God is that you understand redemptive history and you understand the main events that are reflective of how God is. So anyway, these two main events, the cross and the day of the Lord, these two events draw out of the situation of humanity how we are. They They bring to a confrontation about where we put our trust and faith. And we either, in relation to the cross and the day of the Lord, we either put our faith for righteousness, sacrifice, for being made right in the sight of God in ourselves, or we put it in God. And for salvation, we either put it in human beings and the strength of man to fix things, or we place it in God. And this is one of the primary uh, uh, characteristics of apocalypticism, those who are familiar with the academy understand that there's a, there's a whole body of study around that phrase with as much baggage as it, as it carries and, and the brokenness of the concept, it, it is what it is. Those who aren't familiar with, with the academy, just when I say apocalypticism, just reference everything that revolves around the day of the Lord, right? But the primary characteristic of apocalypticism is that God is the one. It's all about God. And everything is concluding, it's coming to a climax with God. God is the one who's going to be vindicated. God is the one who's going to be honored. God is the one who's going to be exalted. And so as you read through the prophets, this is the, whenever the day of the Lord is described, it's usually in reference to the strength of man and the, the, the idolatry of man and the, and the pride of man, especially Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 13. <clears throat> so, with reference to the cross and the day of the Lord, you have two main perversions that, put, that, that lead people to put confidence in the flesh. You have a Jewish perversion and a Gentile perversion. 
A Jewish perversion of the day of the Lord and a Gentile perversion of the day of the Lord. You have a Jewish perversion of the cross and a Gentile perversion of the cross in broad general terms. So we'll look at the day of the Lord first. The Jewish perversion of apocalypticism in the day of the Lord is the the insurgent movements that happen in Second Temple Judaism between the Old and New Testaments. And for us, removed a couple thousand years, being Gentiles, there's a lot of distance and disconnect between us and the Maccabees, right? Usually you reference anything intertestamental, the Maccabees, it's like whoop, glaze goes over people's eyes. It's just, <laughs> so hang in there with me. So just a little context of, of intertestamental d- development. After the Israelites go into exile into Babylon, then they come back out and they're ruled over by the, by the Persians. And then you have Alexander and the Greeks and then his empire splits into the, the Ptolemaics rule, rule over, uh, over Israel. And then you have the, uh, the Seleucid Empire that, that rules over it. And then you have the rising up of the Maccabeans. And so you have Matthias, Maccabee, and his sons. And part of which I really wish, you know, the, the, the brokenness of the Reformation. Why did we do away with the Deuterocanon, you know, the Apocrypha? Because it's it's so helpful just to understand the transition into the New Testament. And so anyways, uh, I, I just want to give you an idea of how the prophets and how things uh, get shaped intertestamentally within Jewish culture about how God is going to work and how God is going to come and bring salvation. And so the Maccabees are central to that. So this is Josephus' uh, description of that. So he says, he... I mean, Matthias also overthrew the idol altar and cried out, If, he said, anyone be zealous for the laws of his country and for the worship of God, let him follow me. And when he said this, he made haste into the desert with his sons and left all his substance in the village. Many others did the same also and fled with their children and wives into the desert and dwelt in caves. Many of those who escaped joined themselves to Matthias and appointed him to be their ruler who taught them to fight even on the Sabbath day. So Matthias got a great army about him and overthrew their, their idol altars and slew those who broke the laws. Even all that he could get under his power, for many of them were dispersed among the nations round about them for fear of him. So in context to uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and, and the, the height of kind of Greek perversion of, of Jewish culture and law, You have a family that rises up, a man that rises up, and he goes out into the wilderness and gathers those zealous for God around him into a great army, and he's elected as their ruler, and they go in and they cleanse the temple. His son's after him. And so you have a a culture that develops that is, that perverts... I'm not making a judgment call about the Maccabees. I don't know one way or the other. But from that tradition, you have a culture that develops that perverts the the prophets and views that the day of the Lord is going to come in synergy with human being participation. Right When the prophets lay it out that, no, the Lord will come, Isaiah 65, with fire from heaven. And he will descend, Malachi 4, he will come like burning like an oven and he'll, he'll make the wicked like chaff and consume them. <clears throat> so anyway, you have a, a culture that develops and you have a number of insurgent movements that begin to, to happen in, in relation to when the Romans come in and overthrow the, the Hasmoneans, the, the, the Maccabees and, and their, uh, the guys that followed them. And so you had these insurgent, Jewish insurgent movements that viewed that if we just gather enough men that are zealous for God and consecrated and devoted and and what would happen is that they would gather themselves out in the wilderness or in the inner courts to plan and strategize to cast off the wicked oppressor and and such. So examples of these is like, I won't read the, you, you have another example there of Josephus when he's describing one such insurgent movement around the fall of Jerusalem. 
So in Acts 21, when Paul is, is uh, being held and they ask him, are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And this is in reference to kind of the zealot movement that, that raised up around this hope. Acts 5, for before these days, the, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. And so this is a, it's a powerful dynamic that's happening in first century Jewish culture of this is how the day of the Lord is going to come. This is how the age to come is going to transition from this age, is, a, is around the strength of man and the strength of the flesh being raised up with God, and then the angels will come and, and aid them in this. And so Jesus and John are actually a radical correction of this uh, flow of thought. And so Matthew 24 we might think that Matthew 24 is just kind of like, well, that was common Jewish expectation. It really wasn't. You had a wide variety of ideas in Judaism at the time. And John and Jesus represent a radically apocalyptic interpretation that wasn't held by the Sadducees, that wasn't held by the Zealots, that was kind of held by the Essenes, but it's not as though everybody just assumed that these things were true. And so we have confirmation that this is actually the way we interpret it. Anyway, so Matthew 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Because it, it had become assumed that the, um, someone like Maccabe, the, uh, Judas Maccabeus would raise up in the desert and God would confirm that this is the Messiah with signs and wonders, etc. So... See, I have told you beforehand, so if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. And so he's correcting, saying, no, this is how salvation is going to come. It doesn't come by the strength of the flesh. It comes by God radically and apocalyptically coming in glory and and rooting up wickedness from the earth and casting it into eternal fire. <clears throat> and so this is also one of the great ironies of the crucifixion and the gospel narratives is that the, the Jews, for the hope that they were serving God night and day, they traded their true Messiah for an insurrectionist. Right? That's Barabbas. You know, you watch these movies and they portray Brabus like some mad whatever it's like no he was an insurrectionist like just look at the text he, he was what they had put their hope in to deliver them and so they traded that hope for their true messiah and crucified the one that um, would ultimately deliver them so anyway this is John and Jesus's message as a correction to the Jews in that day that the kingdom of God is at hand because the day of the Lord would initiate the kingdom of God. And, uh, and when they say the kingdom of God is at hand, it's evoking all the, the prophetic testimony that the day of the Lord is at hand. And so that's what all those references are. And then Luke 3 is a parallel to Matthew 3. So when they say the kingdom of God is at hand, it's an extremely fearful Thing that, that, that brings sobriety and, oh God, am I right with you? And so Luke 3 is a description of what they understood with the preaching of John the Baptist that the kingdom's at hand. And, and John describes it as the Messiah is at the door. He, he has his winnowing fork in his hand. He's going to chop down all the trees that don't produce good fruit and he's going to cast them into eternal fire. He's going to gather the wheat into his barn, into the kingdom and everlasting life, and he's going to cast the wicked, the chaff, into, into fire. And so Matthew 16 is, is uh, also a, an example of that where Jesus is correcting 
in the minds of even his disciples that this is this insurrectionist hope is not uh, is is not of God. It's actually directly from the devil. And so when Jesus describes when he asks his disciples, "Who do you say I am?" and and they say, "We believe you're the Son of God, God's Son, right? The Davidic covenant, and and we believe you're the Messiah." And, Yes, Peter, that, that wasn't because that was the controversy. Like, is this guy actually the one who, who will, that God will anoint with power and raise the dead, etc.? And so they say, yes, you, you, we believe you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, that's, that's good. You know, you, you didn't figure that out on your own. God led you to that. And he says, but before then, the, the Son of Man will be led up and, and killed and crucified. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. This, it doesn't work this way, Right. We go out in the desert, we, we get in the, the inner rooms, and, and all of Israel will repent, and, and they'll come to us, and, and by, the, by the help of God, we'll raise up and we'll cast off the enemies. And, and Jesus is like, no, no, no. You have in mind the things of man. You don't, you don't have in mind the things of God. You, you don't interpret the prophets right. You don't, you, you don't relate to God rightly. Because if you want to follow me, you put your hope in God alone. And God leads the righteous on a path of suffering unto eternal life. And if you don't embrace the cross, right? Because the cross is common to them after the, the Romans came in and the insurgent movements. Because that's how they crucified the insurgent guys, right? So everybody understood what the cross meant. So if you don't take up your cross, embrace martyr, martyrdom, lay down your life in this age. You don't take up your life in this age. If you want eternal life, if you want to inherit the king, you lay down your life in this age if you want to inherit eternal life, right? Because the Son of Man will come with the angels of heaven, and he will judge men uh, according to their deeds. Anyway, so the eschatological application, which we've already kind of touched upon, Luke 17 is probably the best example of Jesus' correction of uh, the, the Jewish insurgent hope that's happening at the time. So now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was, was coming. And so just a little side note, if you're not familiar with first century Judaism, most people are familiar with the four groups within first century Judaism, right? Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealot, Essene. And those are, the others are fairly homogenous groups, right? They all kind of believe the same thing. But the Pharisees were a divided house. The Pharisees had two main groups, what's called the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai. And if I've just stepped off into like Judaic hinterlands for some of you, <laughs> you know, for a Jew, Hillel and Shammai is like when we talk about Paul and Peter. It's schoolboy information, right? So Hillel and Shammai were two guys right before the birth of Jesus that really defined the Tanaim, the group of of rabbis that led to the production of the Mishnah and the Talmudic material and such. And so Hillel was a more kind of tolerant, uh, merciful uh, type of approach to the law and relating, and Shammai was more strict and rigid and hardcore, right? Jesus generally sided with Hillel. Hillel is the one who, it, it, it seems, coined more or less the, the golden rule, do unto others, he said a little different. And the great commandment, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. So generally, Jesus sides with Hillel, rather, and he generally bashes on Shammai, not always. But so you have within the Pharisees the, a, a part, a group of the Pharisees that are of the house of Shammai that also kind of side with the zealots, right? So not all Pharisees are the same. I don't want to get too much into it. But this point of when the Pharisees come to him, it's probably a kind of Shammai type oriented Pharisee of, uh, and some people believe the whole zealot movement was birthed from Zadok the Pharisee, that he was a disciple of Shammai. And, and clearly, as you get to 70 AD, the house of Shammai is, is sides with the zealot movement. And then afterwards, Hillel, because 70 AD failed miserably. So then Hillel arose, and that's why Hillel is, is, uh, is revered within Judaism. Anyway, so the Pharisees come to him and say, tell us when the kingdom of God is going to come. And he says, the kingdom of God 
does not come with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. But the verb to be, if it's used in relation to location, it communicates movement, right? So like Matthew 21, the baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from men, right? But it's, it's the same verb, to be. The baptism of John. Uh, uh, from where was it, right? From where did it come or originate? And so the, the verb can be uh, communicate movement if it's used in relation to location. So his point is, is that uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> for behold, the kingdom of God comes into your midst. It doesn't arise out in the wilderness, They won't say, look, there it is out in the wilderness. Look, here it is in the inner courts, because Luke 17 is a parallel to Matthew 24. He says, the the kingdom of God comes into your midst. And we know that that's what he means by the next verses. Because he says, uh, the days will come when you long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. They will say to you, look there, look here, do not go away, do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer and be rege- uh, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Just like it was with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. It doesn't come by the strength of the flesh. It comes like lightning from the east to the west, and it comes like the days of Noah, suddenly it comes. It doesn't come with signs to be observed. Men out in the wilderness gathering their strength. Men in the inner room conspiring, right? So this is the correction to the Jewish perversion of apocalypticism in the first century. And then, right after that, he tells a parable, right? And so the parable, which we're fairly all familiar with, also gets perverted severely in our own day. But the parable is fairly straightforward. And it's saying the exact same thing. He told them a parable to the effect that they are always to pray and not lose heart. And by Jesus means by lose heart is put your hope in some man who goes out to the wilderness and gathers the strength of the flesh around him. That's what he has in mind. That's losing heart. It's hoping in the flesh rather than hoping in God. And so he says... In a certain city, there was a judge who, of course, represents God in the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow representing the the body of faith in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary, right? Because the day of judgment is the day of justice when God rights the wrongs of the world and he punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. So he give me justice against my adversary for while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And so this is a reference primarily to Malachi 3, if you're familiar with, with how the, the Israelites began to cease serving in the temple night and day with diligence because... The day of judgment had not yet come and God had not made a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. And so Jesus is picking up on that same theme where Jesus is pushing people to faith and keep crying out to God, Oh God, how long before you judge the inhabitants of the earth? How long before you come and make things right? How long will the wicked rule on the earth? How long will the righteous suffer? Right? This is, the, this is called not losing heart. So he says, uh, the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily or suddenly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in God on the earth? That's his point. That's why he's telling the parable is that he's pointing out to the people that he's telling the parable to is that you don't have faith in God. Right? And he's encouraging those who hear him to put your faith in God. All right, so page 22, 
That's the Jewish perversion of the apocalyptic hope, putting faith in God for the day of the Lord rather than putting faith in the flesh. The Gentile perversion begins to happen late in the New Testament. And it begins by what, what became known as Gnosticism. And all through the early church fathers, Simon uh, in Acts 8 is understood, is known as the father of Gnosticism. And that it became, uh, it, his ideas developed into the ideas of what's called realized eschatology in which the hope, the eschatology, the end of the Law and the Prophets is spiritually reinterpreted and fulfilled at the first coming, right? It's realized eschatology at the first coming. And this has many, 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 many different forms throughout the history of the church. <laughs> so many that it starts to boggle your mind. But it's a beautiful phrase because you can just engulf all of them, you know, like I was watching this video of this guy that was just, I mean, he's just a, the most arrogant theologian, unbelievable, and he's just going on and on, and I described it to Bill as blah, 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 realized eschatology, blah, 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 right, is that, it's just more of the same song, different verse, same song, different verse, you know, it's so old. Anyway, so, but the point of what it is, is, uh, for example, in the Gospel of John, which, I mean, Gospel of Thomas, which everybody knows is a very clear Gnostic text, you have Jesus' his disciples coming to him, saying, when will the repose of the dead, the resurrection of the dead come about, and when will the new world come? And Jesus says to them, supposedly, what you look for, what you look forward to has already come, but you do not recognize it. And so this is what the Gnostic hope was, that what the Jewish, the Jewish eschatology and hope is a, is a, is a carnal belief. And we, we, look, we have the secret knowledge that it's already been realized now in us and we will escape into immateriality, etc. And so um, 1 Timothy 6, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter, Right? Because the day of the Lord is a holy thing. Depraved men <clears throat> get their thousands of years of their day. The day of man, the strength of man, the glory of man. right? But God gets His day when He receives honor and glory and blessing. right? And so the godless chatter is, or other translations say, irreverent babble. right? It's irreverent. It... it, it, it it doesn't under, it treats holy things like you read Origen and, and he just mocks the Jewish hope and it's like you treat holy things as irreverent. And what's scary is that fire comes out from the ark in those kinds of situations, right? Like, and that's how the day of the Lord will be to those who, who treat as an, as an unholy thing that which is holy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Right? Not the kingdoms of men. The one that you approve of. The one that you put your stamp on. Your kingdom come. Oh God, how long? But give us this day to walk in righteousness. To walk out. To be satisfied and content with what we have. Our daily bread. Help us forgive God as you are being merciful to the wicked. Help us be merciful, God. And, and forgive our enemies. Because if you don't forgive your enemies... You won't be forgiven on that day, right? And so this is, when they ask him, teach us to pray. It's the same thing as in Luke 18. This is how you pray. You set your hope in God and look forward to his coming. Anyway, so, um, so it's godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge or gnosis in the Greek, right? So this is what they had, and which some have professed to in so doing have wandered from the faith. Right? Because the Jewish hope is a very simple, straightforward, very simple, linear timeline that goes from creation to consummation, the day of the Lord, moves in a very simple, direct path. And the idea was is that, that the world, they had become worldly and they'd wandered off the course into the world. They had wandered from the truth and wandered from the faith by embracing uh, these ideas of realized eschatology. 2 Timothy 2, avoid the godless chatter 
Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have wandered away from the truth. Because that was the point, is that they believed they had received the secret truth, the secret revelation, the secret knowledge, that they had come into the real truth, and that the Jewish truth was some carnal earthly thing, and we received a higher truth that we were going to escape the, the tomb of death in our body, etc. And so, uh, so that's what Paul is kind of backhanding. No, they've wandered away from the truth. They haven't discovered the truth. They've wandered away from it. They say the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands, stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are His. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Right? So there's no uncertain terms about it. It's related to in a very dramatic way as leading people off the path to eternal life as leading them away into the path of destruction towards Gehenna and a lake of fire. <clears throat> so you have the same thing as driving in 1 Corinthians 15. That's why they say there's no resurrection of the dead. Not because they become some kind of Christian Epicurean. Paul's point in saying that, you know, if there's no resurrection of the dead, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He's, he's simply saying, you've become just like the world, right? You've become just like the Epicureans and 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 embracing uh, Gnosticism or realized eschatology. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying the day of the Lord has already come. Because that day doesn't come unless you get the Antichrist declaring himself as God in the temple, etc., etc., right? It's like... It's a straightforward reading of the prophets. That doesn't come unless these other things come, right? The king and the resurrection, they don't come unless you the day of judgment, Gehenna. It's like, the kingdom's now what? Like, there's a, there's a Messiah ruling on Zion, that kind of deal. So anyway, so that's his point. He says, he says uh, they perish because they refuse to love the truth. It's the same uh, he's referencing after that bit. The, the, the lie is referencing the realized eschatology before. They refuse to love the truth, what they say they've come into, and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth and have delighted in wickedness. So it's all the same language around uh, the Gnostic realized eschatology, right? And then Re Revelation 2, uh, for... Uh, you, you get a real clear description of the Nicolaitans, and, and Nicholas was one who embraced Gnosticism and followed Simon, etc. So I'm about out of time. I want to uh, keep pushing ahead. It's First uh, John 4, as far as the eschatological application. First John 4, the spirit of Antichrist is the Gnostic spirit that realizes the Jewish hope in this age. And... Uh, and so you get a real clear description between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so that's concerning the day of the Lord and the second coming of the Messiah. That is putting hope in the flesh versus putting hope in God, right? And you have both the Jewish and the Gentile perversion of it. Now concerning the cross, you have persecution that revolves around the proclamation of the cross. And it's the same approach that derives persecution concerning the day of the Lord that does the same thing about the cross. And what it's the same idea that gets persecution that Paul endures. John 3 is a perfect example of how the two are connected together, right? And John 3 is one of those that's like, oh, the commentaries on John 3 are brutal. So John 3 is a very straightforward in which Jesus has just cleansed the temple, right? The, the, the Lord you're seeking, Malachi 3, will come swiftly into his temple. He'll purge the, the, the Levites, etc. So Jesus just cleansed the temple, and so there's all a ruckus of, is this the Messiah, right? So Nicodemus comes to him at night, right, in the inner courts, etc., and says, uh, says to him, we know you're a teacher from God because you wouldn't be able to do these things unless God is with him, right? So there's a question of, are you the Messiah? 
And Jesus answers, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And the other place you get this same language, of course, is 1 Corinthians 15, where you have Paul, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It'll come like the twinkling of of an eye. Paul is correcting the Gentile perversion of the apocalyptic hope. Jesus is correcting the Jewish perversion, but it's the same point, is that flesh and blood cannot see the kingdom of God. No insurgent movement, no Maccabean movement can see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, "How how uh, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter a second time in his mother's womb? Jesus answers, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, so that's a reference to Ezekiel 36. So he's interpreting Ezekiel 36 and 37 on apocalyptic terms saying that that this is how they're fulfilled at the day of the Lord, not on insurgent terms. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, right? You'd live by the sword, you'd die by the sword. That's how that goes. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, right? Because the first man was of the flesh, the second man is of the Spirit, and the resurrection of the dead will happen by the Spirit. He says... Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, right? You don't control the wind. You don't set that day. You don't determine the day of the Lord and the coming of God. He says, um, so it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can this be? Jesus answered him, you're the teacher of Israel, yet you don't understand this? Truly I say to you. So clearly Jesus has an expectation that you should understand the law and the prophets, right? He doesn't have some kind of secret, new, spiritualized view of the kingdom. He's just saying, you are clearly interpreting the prophets along the lines of confidence in the flesh. And so he says, uh, you don't understand. Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know. And so in context to the, the first two chapters, we, as most people agree, that that's John the Baptist. Me and John, we speak of what we know, and we declare how God is going to come and how the future is going to unfold. And he says, We bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, in reference to the kingdom of God, the Davidic throne, the Messiah, etc., how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? How will you believe if I tell you of how God will atone for the sins of His people? The end of Deuteronomy 32 and the Song of Moses. For no one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Who stood in the counsel of the Lord, Jeremiah 23? I have stood in the counsel of the Lord. I understand how God is going to orchestrate redemptive history. And He's going to hand the Messiah over to suffer as a sacrifice. Before coming in His glory to establish and and restore all things. I've stood in the counsel of the Lord. I have in mind the things of God. I don't have in mind the things of men. Right? I have, I have been the one who's ascended. And so he says, um, no one's ascended except the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So that's how he makes the direct transition from the earthly things in the kingdom of God. And I've told you how the day of the Lord's going to come and the kingdom's going to come. But if you don't believe me in that, if you put your hope in the flesh and the strength of man for that, how are you going to believe me when I tell you about the sacrifice and the divine atonement? If you're going to put your hope in the flesh for salvation, why, why would you listen to me about putting your hope in God for righteousness? Right? Because they're both driven by the same thing. And this is Paul's whole confrontation with the circumcision group. And the whole issue of justification by faith is that it's putting hope in the strength in the flesh instead of putting hope in God to be accounted righteous on that day. Right? So you have a clear, the perversion of first century Judaism was not nationalism, was not whatever, whatever. The perversion of first century Judaism was pride and arrogance. And uh, to whatever degree you're familiar with the new perspective on Paul and and how that has all gone down over the last uh, 30 years in the academy, whatever. 
Um, but I just want to put out there that it, it, it's straightforward and simple. First century Judaism was not, uh, the problem was with it was that they were arrogant, Romans 11, okay? It was not with what they hoped for. Paul had the same hope as those men, Acts 24. It's how they approached that hope, how they sought salvation, how they sought to be righteous, righteous with God. And so, um, so Philippians 3, you really get the heart of Paul's drive where uh, uh, most of Jesus' ministry is confronting confidence in the flesh concerning the day of the Lord and salvation eschatology. Most of Paul's ministry is com- confronting confidence in the flesh concerning righteousness unto attaining eternal life, concerning confidence in the flesh and relating the, the basis on which we relate to God. So Philippians 3, he says, Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision. So he's making reference to the circumcision group from Acts 15 and and all through the epistles. We are those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh for the resurrection and eternal life, which is clearly the context Uh, afterwards. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Right? So if anybody was going to attain to the resurrection and inherit eternal life. It should have been me. That's his point, right? And so he says, But whatever I gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. And here's the, I mean, that's the, that's where you get the sticking point, right? Because the Greek is skubalon. And so the King James translates it dung, right? Because the, the, that was the common reference. It can mean anything that means refuse, right? So it can mean garbage or excrement, right? And so, but it was commonly used in relation. So the best English word, and if you actually look in the BDAG, which is the standard lexicon, it actually has that... The, the, it's all crap is the best phraseology for that. It is that crap is the perfect English word because it references both that which is garbage and that which is excrement, right? And so it, you get both sides, and I'm not going to say it over and over, but you get that that's what Paul is saying in that context is that it reeks before God. All of that that I gave my life to, to attain eternal life, reeks before God because the flesh is depraved and every man is in the same boat. And for the really broken of the depraved flesh, it's really good news that it's not based on my broken achievement before God. It's based on His gift and mercy. But for those who aren't quite as broken, who grew up in a solid situation, who whatever, whatever, then it kind of becomes bad news because you slip right into relating on the basis, not of grace, but on the basis of works. Anyway, so uh, I don't want to get into what law and works and all that in relation to the new perspective, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, you're lucky. So, um, So he says, I count them as rubbish, as refuse, And that's the sticking point, because it's cool as long as you proclaim this. But it's bad when you call this refuse, right? Like, we can all get along, bro, if you you just wouldn't call that refuse. Just, Just preach the gospel, do what you do, but don't call this group or that group and what they say refuse, right? But that's the problem, is that it is, is that another gospel is refuse, right? And it's, and it's not a matter of proving yourself right. It's not like I just want to, I just want whatever, like I'm the, I got all the right interpretation, I got whatever. No, it's, 
There's a very narrow path to eternal life and attaining the resurrection. And you can't, if you're off that path, it means you don't get resurrection. And it means people are led down a damned path, an accursed path to everlasting fire. And so that's why Galatians is so fiery, is that you have another gospel that's no gospel at all, that you go by first hearing what you've heard of Christ crucified, and then you finish the race according to strength of the flesh. It's like, no, that is, that is a path that is a curse towards a lake of fire. And so he says, I count it all as refuse, for the, uh, uh, refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him which is a reference to the appearing of God, the appearing of Christ, when the, the, the dark deeds of the earth are exposed and God finds out human beings. And so I want to be found in Him on that day, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or based on the law, Romans 10, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know Him and the power of his resurrection, because the Holy Spirit was given as a stamp for the sacrificial interpretation of the death of the Messiah. Who would believe it? Who would believe it? Who would believe it? That God interprets that man's death as a sacrifice for atonement in place of sin. Who would believe it? Why would you believe it? Why would I believe it? Why would any Jew believe it? Except that there's the the stamp of approval on it called Acts 2 in Pentecost. And we receive the first fruits of our resurrection to make it sure to us that this actually is the path to eternal life, right? So I want to know Him in the Holy Spirit and the power of His resurrection and share in His sufferings becoming like Him in His death that by any means possible, by which He means any means of suffering that God would bring upon my path, Right? 2 Corinthians 1. We were under suffering beyond description. But why did it happen? So we wouldn't rely on ourselves. But it would drive us to cast ourselves on God. To cast ourselves on God. Because he grew up relying on himself. And when, he, when Ananias is told to go pray for this man, Ananias is like, ah, I've heard about this guy. I know he persecutes. And God says, no, he's my chosen instrument to go to the Gentiles. And I will show him how much he must suffer. I will show him how much he must suffer. And so this is what Paul is talking about. I'll embrace anything of the sufferings of Christ in this age to break me of my pride and self-righteousness that I would be found in him on that day, that by any means possible, I would be found with him on that day and attain to the resurrection because this is the singular prize that we're driving after, right? <clears throat> so... Um, so that's why I want to exhort us with this morning. You can look over the last page and, uh, and Luther and the Gentile perversion of a, rather than based on the law, no mystic self-confidence, you have a, a pietistic, monastic self-confidence, which if you understand Luther's life was just as much as, of an animal in his day. And if at the end of his life, Paul says, uh, I mean, Luther says in a letter, if any one, for 15 years, he gave himself radically. If you know Luther, the dude was radical. Just a fireball. And he says, if anyone was a good enough monk to attain to eternal life, that was me. I was that monk. But he found himself a pile of refuse before God until he had the revelation that, that the righteousness of God was counted on his behalf as a gift, right? So anyway, um, yeah, let's pray. God, we just, uh, <clears throat> we present ourselves before you. God, putting our hope in you. Putting our hope not in the flesh, but putting our hope in you, God. And we cast ourselves on you. Like 1 Peter 1, God, we set our hope fully on the grace to be given to us at the revelation of Jesus. We set our hope fully on the salvation that you will bring and we put no hope in the strength of man and in all of the ways of man that raise up and exalt themselves. We know, God, all that will be humbled and we just cast ourselves on you, God, and we look not to ourselves for that day, God, but we cast ourselves at the foot of the cross and we, we drive towards that prize, God. I ask you for everyone in this room 
for a stamp of the Holy Spirit for the things I've said, whether understood or not, God, but a stamp of the Holy Spirit that this is the path to life. Faith in what you've done and faith in what you will do, God. And we exalt and lift you up and say you're the only one worthy of praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.